Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, during this new format of our IREC monthly uh, seminars slash webinars. Um, my name is Sandra Guzman. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of agricultural and biological engineering here at the UF IREC location working on smart irrigation and hydrology. Today we have a really, really exciting talk uh, led by two outstanding uh, San Lucy agents, uh, Ken and Kate, uh, entitled Rain Gardens to Rain Barrels. Thanks everyone for staying at home uh, before anything else and taking care of yourself during these uh, challenging circumstances. Definitely I feel very, very proud of how fast all of us as uh, I, uh, UF, IFAS and general community got up to speed with all of these working from home challenge. I am pleased to introduce today uh, the speakers, King Yoli and uh, Kate Rotindo from the San Lucie Extension Office. Ken is the Natural Resources and Environment Extension agent at the, uh, agent at the UF San Lucie location. He has a master's degree in agricultural education from the University of Florida, and he also got uh, a graduate certificate in environmental education. Um, in addition, he has completed uh, specialty courses such as the tropical biodiversity, um, a short course offered by the Organization for uh, Tropical Studies in Costa Rica. Kate uh, Rotindo is the Urban Horticulture Extension Agent at the San Lucie office, and she has a bachelor's deg uh, degree in horticulture from Colorado State University. Um, both uh, Ken and Kate, and Kate uh, they teach practices that are part of the UF IFAS uh, Friendly Landscape Program. Uh, the FFL program uh, is run by the University uh, of Florida IFAS Extension in association with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Mm, this program basically provides science-based landscaping guidelines and advice that promote uh, water conservation and educate homeowners on how to maintain their lawns and their gardens with less water and less fertilizers and, of course, uh, fewer pesticides. Uh, this program, um, it is strictly an educational program and uh, does not promulgate any kind of regulations. Before I hand the mic over to Ken, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about today's presentation. First, uh, today's seminar will be available on demand after the live session. Uh, we will send you the link uh, for the recording at the end of this session. Um, next, uh, please uh, make sure that your microphone is muted. Uh, I will try to control as much uh, from here, but um, if you have any question for uh, one of our speakers, um, hold on. We will we will have it at the uh, we will have a, a pretty nice conversation at the end of this talk. Uh, or uh, what you can do is um, type uh, type the question in the chat tab that is over here at the bottom of uh, of your play. Um, enjoy the talk, and without any further ado, I will uh, like to kick things off by welcoming our San Lucie Natural Resources and Environment Extension agent Ken Gioli. Ken, over to you. My name is Ken Joelli, and I'm the University of Florida IFAS Natural Resources Extension Agent for St. Lucie County. Much of the work I've done over the years has been done to help people conserve Florida's beautiful natural resources. I'm an instructor with the Florida Master Naturalist Program, and you can find out about us online at masternaturalist.ifas.ufl.edu. I also teach people about the principles of sustainability including sustainability of freshwater resources. Not only do people benefit from sustainability of our Florida's freshwater resources, but so does wildlife like this roseate spoonbill on the shore of Lake Okeechobee. Every Floridian has a role to play when conserving fresh water. We can use low fluid irrigation systems, for example. We can also use plants that require very little water, including many native Florida plants and we can have properly calibrated irrigation systems. Rain barrels are just another way Floridians can help conserve rainwater on their properties. 
Rain barrels have been used since the dawn of agriculture to help people store fresh water. Rainwater harvesting is common on islands with limited fresh water resources. The rain barrels I will be talking about today will help you store 50 gallons of fresh water per rain barrel. They can also be used on buildings that have roofs with or without gutters. Some of the statistics that I can share with you is one inch of rain falling on a 1,000 square foot roof can yield up to 625 gallons of water. So you can see we're only going to be harvesting a fraction of that water that could be harvested. These rain barrels can also help you reduce erosion on your property. They can help you reduce runoff pollution that can make it to our estuaries and our ponds. And the store of water will not contain any chlorine, lime, or calcium. And best of all, it's free from Mother Nature. Before you start assembling your rain barrel, you will have to get some supplies. You'll need to find a 55 gallon food grade quality plastic drum. Avoid using trash cans. I have seen where people have tried using trash cans and sometimes what happens is they split at the seams over time. Now one gallon of water will weigh eight pounds. So if you have 50 gallons of water in your rain barrel, that will weigh 400 pounds. So it's quite a bit of weight that you're gonna need to, uh, to support. So using that 55 gallon food grade quality heavy duty plastic drum is what's gonna be needed. Make sure that it did not have chemicals in it. We would not want pesticides or fertilizers in that barrel before you use it. Also get a three quarter inch PVC elbow for your overflow, or if you're gonna connect more than one rain barrel together. Use a three quarter inch hose bib, gutter strainer, PVC cement, and if you have gutters, you'll need a downspout if you don't have gutters, you'll need window screens to keep mosquitoes out. This is an example of a rain barrel that's been assembled and painted and decorated. Now I assembled it, but Dale Galliano, St. Lucie County Master Gardener, she was the one that actually decorated this rain barrel. So how do you assemble your rain barrel? Now this next video clip was produced by Fred Berkey. He interviewed me where we and we assembled a rain barrel together and talked about its installation and use. Ken, what type of water actual containers do you use for harvesting? Well, there are many different options out there. Probably the easiest thing that people can use is a 55 gallon blue plastic food grade quality drum. And of course the extension office um, and the rain barrels that we're making, that's what we use. Well, I know that you've been very instrumental in starting this in South Florida, uh, and you use it quite a bit. Actually, can you go through exactly how you do it? In other words, once you get the, where do you get the barrel? How do you, you know, drill it and so forth? Well, would you like me to describe the, the process that yeah, your wonderful you assistant Pat will be <laughs> yes, going through? Yes, yes, we'll have her writing the barrel. Very good. <laughs> uh, the very first step is to go ahead and drill a hole in the top. And basically all you do is you just draw the outline of the um, of the downspout and then you drill little holes um, and then you just kind of connect the dots and you'll remove that piece of plastic and that will be the entrance for the downspout to go into the top of the rain barrel. Um, the next step in the process is to drill a hole for the overflow and also for the spigot and basically what you'll do is you'll have a 15 16 inch drill bit sometimes I have to use a one inch drill bit but for the most part um, people are using 15 16 inch drill bit just drill the two holes and um, those pieces of plastic will be removed and then you just slowly screw in um, the spigot and the overflow. That sounds pretty easy. Is it, it is really easy. that easy? Well, you know, the only thing that people really need to keep in mind is um, the actual location, the site location where they're going to be placing the rain barrel. If they're going to um, have it in a certain location on the property, you know, how does the downspout go into the top of the rain barrel? Um, do they want a spigot facing in a certain direction? you know, would it be um, a problem if they had it facing one wall instead of another? Oh, I see. So one yeah. placement of the overflow and the spigot is important. Uh, also, um, you know, are they going to want to hook up more than one barrel? Um, people might want to start off with one rain barrel, but then sometimes people so want to hook up multiple. So you can put these together? Correct. I'll be doggone. Okay. Now, if you do you have an overflow on this? Uh, you will have an overflow, and the nice thing about that is, you know, you will store 55 gallons of water pretty quickly. Yeah. In fact, now you mentioned something. Now you said that you cook the gutter into the barrel. Yes. How about if you don't have a gutter? Well, the nice thing about that is you can use rain barrels for homes without gutters as well. Um, you'll probably want to put the rain barrel somewhere like in a trough where 
where um, all the water, where comes, the water comes down. And basically all you do is you just cut a hole in the top of the rain barrel. Just take the top off. Just take the top off. And what I've done is I've used hardware cloth, which is kind of uh, like chicken wire, you know, with a smaller mesh, and a little bit of window screen. Now I hate to cut Fred short, but I will put the entire video that that clip came from on the blog associated with this webinar. Before I conclude my portion of the presentation, I will show you one rain barrel that's been fully installed by the master gardeners in St. Lucie County. Now you can see there's enough room between the hose bit, the bit at the bottom and the ground where they can put a watering can underneath that and carry water to where they need it in the garden. So let's say you don't want to assemble your own rain barrel and certainly you don't want to decorate it then you can go ahead and purchase one. Now what you can do is check with local garden centers and see if they do sell them, but you can also check online and see if you can find them there. Well, that's it on rain barrels. I'm sure you probably have some questions. If you don't mind, please holding them until the end of the webinar. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Guzman. Thank you, Ken, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, what I love uh, of your presentation the most is to see that how easy and inexpensive it is to have water for our yards. Um, we will keep receiving questions for Ken if you have any other question uh, in the chat window. Um, but uh, at the end of the presentation, we will have some time for discussion. So if you want to hold on, that's fine as well. Uh, with that, uh, let's give a welcome to Kate Rotinda or Urban Horticulture Extension Agent and the San Lucy office. Uh, Kate, the room is yours. Good afternoon and welcome again and thank you for coming to our webinar this afternoon. Like Sandra mentioned, my name is Kate Rotundo and I'm the Urban Horticulture Agent for UFIFA St. Lucie County Extension. I thought we could all use a little humor today, and I popped in a picture of my dog, Bella, who is always excited to talk about things, uh, but especially something like rain gardens, as we transition from what Ken taught us about uh, rain barrels. So what exactly is a rain garden? You'll see on your screen a definition of it really being a type of landscape area with appropriate vegetation that right plant, right place principle, those specific species that are gonna be important for our rain garden design that help catch excess rainwater that's coming down from roof lines or gutter systems that are attached to buildings or apartments or houses, and actually allowing that water to slow down and filter back into the ground where it can recharge groundwater resources. So we got a little nutshell explanation of what a rain garden is, but why would we use something like this or implement these practices in our garden? We all are somewhat aware of some of the water quality issues that we're having in our sensitive waterways. And this is one that we can use, these rain garden designs, we can use these to help reduce stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff carries a lot of things, including fertilizer, pesticides, that come off of our landscapes, oils and debris that come off of impervious surfaces such as roadways or sidewalks, landscape clippings like grass clippings that are excess, they're sources of excess nitrogen. All of these things can contribute to this non-point source pollution that is harmful to our waterways. Rain gardens can actually help to remove some of these pollutants through this infiltration action and some of the plant absorption. What I think is really exciting and neat about a concept of a rain garden is that th this can be a highly functional part of our landscape. It can also increase the biodiversity in the landscape and help with wildlife and also aesthetic values in our landscape. I've listed here some of the rain garden do's and don'ts. We'll start with the do list. Do place those rain gardens or, or look for a site that's at least 10 feet away from a house or a building to really prevent that water from seeping into the foundation. Look for a site that the rain garden could happen in where it's in full sun, away from you know, existing tree roots, those large trees that we have. We wanna be in that full sun area in the landscape. 
Also choosing an existing spot in our yard that perhaps is a low spot uh, that normally drains fairly quickly after rain, uh, but can, can hold some water and also tends to be dry in the dry season. So those existing low spots, a lot of times we find those in the landscape where perhaps some other turf and other plant species aren't doing very well, this might be a good spot for a rain garden. Some of the rain garden don'ts. Don't place that rain garden site or where you're going to put that within 25 feet of a septic tank or a well. It's not recommended to really cut tree roots that to make room for things such as rain gardens. This can actually, this practice, if we start cutting uh, large tree roots, this can severely damage the tree and the health of the tree. Don't choose that site that has standing water. The whole purpose really of a rain garden is to encourage that infiltration and the slowing of the water, not to necessarily have standing water. Another important part or concept of the whole rain garden design is really the plant species. I have a list here that you'll see on your screen uh, that I've included most of them. There's a few more that I didn't put on there, but we have resources at the end uh, to show you that full list. These are just ones that I thought were kind of superstars and people know about these species. These are ones that can tolerate wet and dry conditions. And so that rain garden design, that's the whole concept is that perhaps sometimes part of the year it might be very wet and other times it's very dry. These species can tolerate that. Not all plant species are really happy with that. So we want to choose that right plant, right place for those, those rain garden designs. And these plant species do very well. So I have pictured uh, here, we have goldenrod, some canna lily species, the swamp sunflower, our milkweed species, native and non-native species, Carolina aster, and then we have our frog fruit. These are all species that are listed that can handle these conditions for rain garden designs. And like anything that we do in our landscape, even in rain gardens, there's gonna need to be maintenance that is, is occurring throughout uh, the garden's life, especially as we start to get established with those plant species that you've put in. Weeding is a, a large aspect of that. We don't necessarily want weeds to be soaking up that water and taking over. We want the plant species that we put in to really thrive. And so weeding is one of those maintenance issues. Mulch is going to be another maintenance issue that it can be helpful as far as keeping weed pressure down, keeping that soil moisture level. The other aspect of maintenance is really starting to learn about your plants and their growing habits. So when to cut back, when to divide some of those species that are able to be divided as that rain garden gets established and those plant species get established. Here you'll see pictured uh, the beginning of a rain garden where actually that rain is coming down. You'll see the downspout of a gutter system. And I have a little red arrow there pointing to those rocks, which we call riprap, which is a deliberate uh, implementation of those rocks in that rain garden to really help slow down that water that's coming down from that big gutter system. We've all been a part of those afternoon tropical rainstorms that really provide a lot of water come rushing down uh, very quickly. This can actually help physically break up that water and slow it down before it actually gets down to that rain garden where you'll see sort of the beginning of a teardrop shape. There's mulch in there with several native grasses. That's the beginning of that rain garden. In this slide, I wanted to show you just some different designs of rain gardens that are very small compared to uh, ones that you'll see that are a larger part of the landscape where you see that rain gutter pointed towards the rain garden instead of going down that driveway or down that impervious surface. Where you'll see at the top corner, that's more of a, a large scale. That's actually implemented in a parking lot where the water that rushes off, that storm water that rushes off from our parking lot or impervious surfaces goes right into those larger scale rain gardens where the other one with some uh, swamp sunflower, that's a smaller, more homeowner looking uh, rain garden where those species, but again, all of those species in each three of those pictures are ones that are on that list uh, that can 
tolerate really those wet and dry conditions that our rain gardens are going to experience. The other part that I'd like to mention in those two photographs, especially you can see that use of mulch to really keep that weed pressure down and also keep that soil moisture level uh, buffered as sometimes it will be very, very dry and other times be very wet. I wanted to end with this slide to encourage you all to go to our UF IFAS blog to follow up on some of the resources that we have after this webinar. These are three UF IFAS websites or links that I use to create this PowerPoint presentation. And I think you'll find helpful for some of the design principles and aspects and also some of the plant lists that we went over. Thank you so much for joining me.